Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians both past and present of the lands of which we live and work. Welcome to you all. My name's Jill Mills and tonight we'll be talking about lymphedema. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, if you have any technical problems, you can call 1800 733 416. The number will pop up in the chat box you'll see there. Um, if you have trouble hearing or viewing or anything, just ring that number and um, the technical support guys will help you. Um, now with the chat box, please take part, talk to each other, ask questions. We'll try and get to most of them. We can't always get to all of them. Um, if you feel a bit distracted by the chat box, don't worry. Um, we'll be sending you the recording later and you can watch it at your leisure. So, um, and again, if anything happens tonight that sort of triggers you, you can ring Lifeline at any time on 13 11 14. So let's get started. So I'd like to introduce the panel. So I've got next to me, we've got two Helens tonight. Mm -hmm. We've got Helen J and Helen M. Welcome. Mm -hmm. And Asha, welcome to you all and thanks for coming mm -hmm. tonight. So we'll start off with Helen Jay, who's going to talk a little bit about her story and experience with lymphedema. Well, here we go. Over to you. Yes. You're in control of the mouse yes. now. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so hi, my name's Helen and I have secondary lymphedema in my left arm and my left hand um, as a direct result of surgery from um, breast cancer. So in 2011, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I had a number of surgeries followed by six months of chemotherapy and followed by six weeks of radiotherapy and during um, some of those surgeries I had a number of lymph nodes removed and as a result of that surgery um, that's how I developed the lymphedema and it, um, my lymphedema flared up between my chemotherapy and my radiotherapy so I did actually um, get lymphedema quite quickly after my surgery. Um, so hopefully what I'll talk about tonight will help consumers, practitioners and everybody, carers, all sorts of people, not just people who have lymphedema. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Hopefully um, some of you can learn something from me and I'm sure a lot of people can relate as well. So what I'll talk about is um, the garments, which I call my tools of my trade, uh, self-management, so strategies I use to help myself. Um, I also use a combination of strategies where I get help from other people. And I also, um, which is pretty common for people with lymphedema, including myself, have a number of difficulties and experiences by having lymphedema. I'll talk about my tricks of the trade and the things that I do to try and help manage my lymphedema. And I also, I'll talk about how I help myself and how I help others and what I see the future holding in terms of lymphedema for the long term. So here's an image of some of my tools of my trade. So starting in the top left corner, um, I haven't used soap for a number of years, so looking after my skin is really important. So I have a range of products, not a lot, um, and they don't have to be expensive. So I use the far left one, I just use on my um, limbs that are affected by lymphedema. The one in the middle, which is a body wash, I use in the shower. And the one on the right, which is simply Vaseline, um, moisturiser I use generally on my body uh, in general. So I use a little bit of a combination but I do use a different one on my affected arm to make sure that keeps extra moist. Down the bottom left I've got a box of bandages and all sorts of things that I use along with a, what they call a Carizio sleeve. So for me to help myself, um, I pull that sleeve on and I use the bandages and wrap them around and often have that overnight and also during the day if I'm not working. So that's an easy way that someone can, um, without having the full bandaging, can help themselves uh, other than just having, say, compression garments. So in the middle, there's my compression garments on average that I use, uh, the glove on the left, the sleeve in the middle, and when I have new garments, I use a glove as well to help pull them on. Otherwise, I end up punching myself and ending up with all, in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so, and then on the top right, I've got a laser. Because part of the problem with my lymphedema is that I get um, fibrosis. I get hardening of the fluid. So, um, when I have other things like massage, it doesn't work so well. So I have a um, what they call a light laser or cold laser and it helps break down um, the hardness of the fluid and then, that, and then you can massage after that and I notice um, effects of that after a couple of days. So it's not straight away but after a couple of days it definitely makes a difference for me. 
The bottom right one is a little bit of a travel kit that I take with me wherever I go. It's always packed in my small suitcase. Um, so it's basically like a little pencil case and it's got a golf ball which I use on my hand to rub around and it's a little, a little couple of bits of like cardboard round, like small versions of the inside of a toilet roll and I use those on my hands as well. So particularly if I'm travelling a lot or sitting down a lot, it just helps because I have a lot of trouble with my hand and that just really helps sort of keep a bit of fluid moving around just when I've got a few minutes and particularly with travelling. So some of the things that I do um, to get help from other people um, so is the bandaging on the far left and examples of that um, are when I've been to Mount Wilga, so Dr Mackey, I've been to um, Dr Mackey at Mount Wilga at Hornsby in Sydney and that's a fantastic opportunity um, to assist with the lymphedema management in a pretty intensive way. So it can be um, you have a, a consult with Dr Mackey and she'll advise you what she thinks is best. And for me, I've been there a couple of times now. I've stayed in the cottage because I'm from out of Sydney and it involved bandaging by a physio. It involved exercise with physios in the gym to help and also um, some swimming, so some aqua, um, sort of aerobic type work. So it was a holistic approach to the lymphedema. And I was there the first time for four weeks, then two weeks um, the year after that. And up in the top right was um, my lovely physio Joy, who's now retired. And the lymphedema massage is a big part of my own self-management as well as when I um, get help from uh, physios, from a lymphedema therapist that I have locally, as well as um, at Mount Wilga. And the massage is the one thing that I do try to do daily. And it is really important and it does really make a difference. So, but sometimes there are parts where fluid um, accumulates, particularly under the armpit and at the back for myself that are tricky places that I can't reach and so definitely getting some external help with um, lymphedema, qualified lymphedema therapists really helps on the, on the massage side and that's the thing that I do daily. Oh, and the kinesio tape, so I've tried the kinesio tape, I call myself a bit of a, a um, therapist guinea pig, so I tend to, if it sounds good, I'll give anything a go, so within reason. So kinesio tape was another um, strategy that I tried. I didn't find it worked for me, but I know it has worked for other people, so using kinesio tape. Um, and then, so having lymphedema has definitely been a difficult experience for me. Um, it's probably actually been psychologically and emotionally been a lot more um, impacted on me a lot more than the actual breast cancer diagnosis. Um, a lot of that's to do with I was a little bit aware, I must admit, the breast care nurse that I saw and the physio at the time of my um, first diagnosis was good and I did have an information session about lymphedema. So through that um, public system where um, if you're having surgery for breast cancer, you were invited along to a two-hour workshop and I found that really helpful. So I actually did know a little bit about it before my surgery. Um, but I certainly wasn't expecting to get it and so now that I've got it I just have to um, work out what's best for me. And so it is a chronic illness, there is no cure at the moment so basically I have it for life. So um, yeah, so it's tricky and it does flare up and it does get better but it is something that has to be managed quite regularly for, for, it, to, um, for it to try and settle down at least and be manageable. I mentioned about the fibrotic tissue, so that reoccurs for me, so it's the hardening in, in the uh, forearm for me and things like laser really help. You can massage all you like, but it won't be effective if you've got hardened um, tissue and fluid. So I've also had difficulty locating uh, a public lymphedema therapist um, in the public health system who performs roles other than just measurements and education, so for me that's a real um, tricky one and so I often do have to um, really focus on my self-management but also go often go to private practice and part of it also is I find with the public health system um, they're usually physios who do uh, work other than lymphedema where lymphedema is just part of what they do and they're often booked out and basically I work full time so for me even if I have made an appointment with a public physio 
I'll have a work commitment which I'll have to cancel and then it could be a couple of months before I get back. So for me, I haven't found that the public health system's worked well for me, but it is obviously going to be different for everyone. Um, it's definitely been a financial burden, so I'm not looking at retiring just yet, even though it would be nice to retire early. But um, So garments are very costly and they need to be replaced very often. And sort of the general gist is um, a lot of people say, oh, roughly on average replace your garments every six months. And obviously that varies person to person. I've got uh, gloves and sleeves. Um, my job, I'm very active and I play a lot of sport and I enjoy my gardening and being outdoors. So I find I actually end up spending um, about three lots of garments um, in a year at least. And I usually have two sets of garments. So I have, because um, ideally it's best to change them every day uh, to keep the, the strengthness and the compression at, at, the, at the right um, compression to make the, it effective for my lymphedema. So, and I also often change them night to day because I often find that the newer one, garments that I wear at night time can be a lot more constricting and I find I can get pains um, up and down my arms. So I tend to wear my little bit older garments of a night time and my newer ones during the day. So I do wear mine night and day, but that's because I feel that I need that sort of compression, particularly because I have the lymphedema in my hand and I find that my hand in particular swells up if I don't have my garments on for very long. So for some people who possibly have it just in their arm or possibly just in their leg, they may find that they don't need it as often, but I find that I pretty much wear my garments 24 hours a day. Um, another uh, issue is that there's um, locally, for me in the Illawarra, there's no local qualified lymphedema therapists that are signed up as a practitioner for the GP chronic disease management program until very recently. And I'm sure that's pretty common um, across the country and I know being in New South Wales that that's um, quite common particularly in the rural and regional areas so even though sometimes there is a bit of an avenue for people to get help with being subsidised through programs such as the GP um, management program there's actually often no um, qualified therapists um, that have actually signed up to that program to help people so again that's been quite tricky. Um, the limitations with my job, so I'm a ranger with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, so part of what I do are things like firefighting. So I find, um, for me, I don't tend, with my fitness, um, as a result of the cancer diagnosis and partially lymphedema in the early stages, um, I was very fatigued and I still find I am. I'm certainly not at the fitness that I used to be and I'm working on that, but it has um, put limitations on, on what I do with my job particularly with the garments and particularly with lymphedema in my hand. I find that I really um, need to be careful with you know, opening gates and locks and you know, I use chainsaws and a range of tools. So often now I actually have a black glove that I often wear for when I'm gardening or working out in the field so that because they get really dirty quite quickly. Um, the, and medical professions are still often generally unaware of the condition, so it's, um, it's about getting awareness out there, particularly even at the GP level. So to educating our own people, even when we go to our own GPs and trying to get them aware. There's a lot of information sheets out now through places like Breast Cancer Network Australia, through Cancer Council. Uh, Lymphedema Action Alliance, Lymphedema Support Group of New South Wales. So next time you go to your GP, even just take along a little information sheet for their practice. Ill-fitting garments is quite common for myself and what I've heard from a lot of people. A lot of them are made overseas and they take a long time to be made. So once you've been measured by a, a trained practitioner, it's usually a, a good two weeks before you actually receive them. So when you get garments back that aren't, particularly ones that are custom made, when you get those back and they're not fitting, they're too long, too short, too tight, it becomes quite stressful and it can be quite difficult to get them replaced and can sometimes be an extra cost that you shouldn't have to pay for. Um, so it, despite the best that you can do and a practitioner can do in terms of the measuring, it is sometimes that the garments um, don't fit properly, have to be sent back and new ones are ordered. So that can put a lot of yeah, stress while you're waiting for those new garments because your other ones aren't working as well as they should be. And again, the psychological and emotional impact 
is pretty devastating. I've shed a lot of tears, and um, but I've also had a lot of um, good times with a lot of new friends that I've made as well. But it, it can be very devastating. It can be very stressful, and that's that's um, normal and that's common and that's to be expected because it is a big impact on someone's life. So my tricks of the trade, things that I do to try and help, I use a glove um, to pull on the new garments, which you saw in the picture, the pink glove. Uh, again, otherwise I put the glove on and then bang straight into the side of my face. I've done that many times. Um, I have a separate sleeve and a glove. That's my choice because of the type of work that I do and, the, and that I play a lot of sport. I would prefer to have a garment that covers my whole sleeve and um, hand, which you can get, but for me it's just those little times when I'm driving or little times between meetings at work or after sport where I can just take my glove off, wet it or give it a bit of um, exercise, put the, pop the glove back on and then off I go again. Whereas particularly with my work because I wear, have to wear long sleeves when I'm outdoors, to be able to just quickly take the glove off does provide a lot of relief for me and does really help. Uh, it's probably not recommended, but I put garments in the fridge in summer, not for a very long time. So heat really affects my lymphedema. It does flare up in summer or in humid um, times. So I just pop them in the, in the fridge, give them a little bit of a chance to cool down and then put them back on my um, arm and uh, hand and off I go. And a, a big one for me is you know, after any sport or after work, I come home and I take my garments off straight away and I wash down my arm and uh, hand in some cool water and it def definitely provides some instant relief. Um, again, I have two sets of garments which I swap daily and I have a set of night and day, um, so that works best for me. And I love, love, love Mo Moby Derm. So for those who aren't sure about what that is, it's um, something that I put in under my glove which is a little piece like this that I cut to size and you can get it from, um, you can buy it in little boxes and it's just another little trick of the trade where with the swelling in my hand and it doesn't have to be just for your hand, you can cut it to size. It comes in uh, a box of about maybe a metre by 50 centimetres and you can cut it to shape. So if you've got any particular swelling, particularly if, if little swelling bits are popping up, um, you can put that in under your garments anywhere on your legs or arms, hands, and it helps um, move the fluid around and just stops it, um, gives it that extra bit of compression and puts little indentations in to try and help move the fluid along. And it's also hard um, initially to find out where to go to get good help and information. So with a cancer diagnosis, you struggle enough trying to get help, but then when you have lymphedema on top of that, where do you go? You've hardly heard of it. You've heard a little bit about it, but not much, and where do you go? So it took me a long time to find out that kind of information, but there are a lot of good organisations and um, services to get good information. So what do I do to help myself and others? I'm involved in a lot of advocacy, so I'm a member of my local Illawarra Cancer Action Network, um, where we have a lymphedema action plan, which involves media, meetings, briefing local MPs, because I'm also an MP liaison officer. I've participated in surveys, research focus groups, uh, been involved in lymphedema information days, in, including the organising committee for the information day that was held in Wollongong last year. And I share information through other projects and community groups I'm involved with, with GPs, other health professionals and other consumers. I'm a member of the Lymphedema Support Group of New South Wales who have a great website and a lot of information to help people find out about practitioners, about lymphedema and not just about secondary lymphedema as a result of cancer but all lymphedema primary and secondary. And I also fundraise and donate um, lymphedema material to local libraries which I did last year as part of a pink sports day with my hockey group. So. Um, so what does the future hold that I see? So starting from the top left and working across to me at the moment, I understand that there's no cure for lymphedema, but as a result of a lot of research um, overseas and in Australia, places like Macquarie University and a combination of lymphedema awareness, which we're all trying to do our little bit, but we can all do more uh, advocacy. We're all that one step closer to getting a cure. And if we can get a cure for cancer, then we can um, ideally get a cure for lymphedema because lymphedema won't be an issue. So as a, in terms of secondary lymphedema, 
from uh, cancer diagnosis, if we can find a cure for cancer, then secondary lymphedema hopefully won't be an issue. So that's what I'm looking forward to and I can see thing, great things in place, which I'm sure Dr Mackey will tell you just about right now and I'm very excited to hear there's a lot of good research, a lot of information, but we can all do more and that's what I'm looking forward to. And as, yeah, uh, although there's a lot of issues, difficulties associated with having lymphedema, I have made a lot of great friends, including these people in this slide. And if I didn't have lymphedema, I wouldn't have met this great group of people and a lot of other people, including people who are here on the panel today. So although we struggle with our lymphedema, there are some good sides to it and um, we just got to run with those when we can. Great, thank you. Now there's a few little questions that have been popping up while you've been talking and that was great. Thank you for sharing all that information and lots of people are going, I can really relate to what, <laughs> what you're saying and, and suggesting different things. Um, so one of the things that just came up was about placing your sleeve in the fridge. It was like, why do you do it? Mm. And do you put it in a bag or do you just put it in the fridge? Generally I just pop it in the fridge yeah. just to get a, just for the coolness, just that instant coolness. That's yeah. just one little thing that works for me. It won't work for everybody and a, a sleeve and a glove are small so it doesn't take long and like I said it's probably not ideal, probably not recommended in terms of the actual garment but it's just something that works for me. Yeah. But ideally cold water, you can't beat it. Um, yeah. And also in terms of what I forgot to take a photo of was what I actually, how I dry my garments. I actually literally just sit them on water bottles um, it to, to dry as well because they, you can't dry them in the sunlight so you dry them indoors. So you look at putting them on top of things that make them dry quickly but also hold their shape. So that's a little trick, finding the right size bottles to fit under your garments to make, help them dry as well. Right. So Lots of hand can, tips there. You can just spray the garment as well. Just get a little water yeah. bottle and yeah. spray the garment. And um, I always say to people that they're made in Germany and Germans don't understand heat. So <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. you do what you can. Exactly. You know? That's yeah. my motto. You do what works for you. I found a lot that works for me and I'm sure there's other people who've got some great things that work yeah. for them as well that I could learn from as well, no True. doubt. Now, just also going back, because a lot of questions were coming in, um, when you're talking about fibrotic tissue, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm guessing that's when you're talking about the hardening yes. of the fluid, because yes. some people were, caught, what's cording? I don't know what cording is. I think it they're getting confused. Yes. Is that something you'll talk about later, maybe? Um, I wasn't going to, but I can. <laughs> um, so cording can occur after treatment where they've removed lymph nodes, and it can be... Um, they call it a cord because it's like a tight band of tissue that right. can be quite painful and it can mm. run, for example, from the armpit down the arm. Yep. So that's different to different tissue thing. fibrosis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it was just defining it is different. Um, very, some people said in there it's a different thing. Yeah. So, yeah. And I had the cording and so for me it was more about light, gentle, appropriate exercise um, and speaking with an expert, but light, gentle exercise and over time it that does disappear, but it just does take a little bit of work. Yeah. So some of the other questions we'll get to when we get to the question time. So we're going to hand hand the mouse yes. over to Helen M now. Thank you. Just make sure that, yeah. Okay. So Thanks, Helen. <laughs> I'd like particularly to thank the Cancer Council of New South Wales for putting this webinar on. Um, it's such so difficult to get the message out and uh, although I've been working for a long time in the system, um, often people come to me and say they hadn't heard anything. So it's very difficult to get the message out. Hopefully we'll do so, that tonight. We'll hopefully <laughs> do that tonight. So I'm, I've just uh, basically tried to concentrate on a little bit about prevention and um, and I'll leave a lot of the management to Asha, who probably knows lots more than I do anyway. But um, so, and some of this is my own experience and talking to lots and lots of people who've gone through the experience. And one of the things that I like to really emphasize is prevent, the word prevention. Um, I've had the experience of going along and asking a doctor if I could get, they could help me on, for a medical condition and they say, yes, we can prevent this from happening, but 
it doesn't the medical term doesn't actually doesn't actually um, say that it actually stops it. So all the activities we talk about, all the recommendations we take talk about in terms of prevention is is that it reduces the threat or the risk in an overall in a population. It doesn't actually stop you from particularly getting lymphedema. So sometimes when we people come to me and say, if I hadn't done this, I wouldn't have got lymphedema. And that's taking on the wrong, putting yourself under unreasonable pressure. For cancer-related lymphedema, the, the lymphedema is caused by the necessary treatment of the cancer. It is not caused by you, and it is rarely a symptom of the cancer itself. So lymphedema is very rarely a presentation for, the, for cancer. Occasionally it is, but for the vast numbers of people who get cancer, related lymphedema or lymphedema caused by cancer, it's caused by the cancer, not by you. You've got enough to do with mm. from that. So, and secondly, uh, and we're going to be talking about some evidence, I'm going to be talking about evidence ab about lymphedema and its causes and prevention and so on. And unfortunately for people who don't have breast cancer related, breast, uh, cancer, lymphedema caused by breast cancer treatment, um, there's not a lot of research out there. So a lot of the research that we're going to talk to relates to breast cancer. And at the moment, we haven't been able to replicate this research in other cancers. But there is quite a lot of, um, you, there's quite a lot of crossover. Um, so if people get a bit annoyed about, I'm talking about research on breast cancer related lymphedema, it's because that's where the research has been done. Hopefully we're starting to look, there's some work, very good work being done in Brisbane in um, gynecological cancers um, and some and on uh, melanoma, but basically it's, we'll be talking about cancer. So there was a question about how many, do will I get breast cancer or will I get lymphedema after a particular cancer and there's quite a lot of information on how many people do get this after after cancer, uh, breast cancer. So we know that these are some trials um, and they're very long trials and there's, they've been brought together many trials and around about 20% of people will get um, uh, lymphedema after breast cancer after breast cancer where the, there's been lymph nodes removal. So you see down at that bottom line, when only one lymph node is taken out, uh, there's a lot lower percentage of people who will get um, uh, lymphedema. For other cancers, we know some of the prevalence of, um, uh, or the incidence after getting breast cancer, uh, after getting cancer. So melanoma is around about 10 to 20 percent. Sarcoma, which is a, um, a very nasty cancer, it's a little bit high because they take a lot of tissue out. After prostate surg surgery, it can be quite variable. So the gynecological cancers, there's a number of those. Um, vulval cancer is very, very nasty cancer for a much higher rate of causing, of getting lymphedema after it. So it does vary a lot from the type of cancer, but it also um, we know that there are other parts of treatment which will also increase the risk of uh, getting lymphedema. So chemotherapy medications, particularly Taxol, Taxotere, a number of different names, but if it's got TAX in it, it is associated with increased lymphedema. Radiotherapy, particularly radiotherapy into the armpit, um, Will, will, is associated with an increased um, risk of getting lymphedema. The number of lymph nodes removed is also associated with it. And um, the number of lymph nodes varies enormously in normal people. So you can have as few as 15 and as many as 50 lymph nodes in the armpit. So the actual number is, is not clear, but, uh, but overall, the more you take out, the more likely you can have um, an lymphedema incidence. But we have to actually look at this balanced with the very extensive research that says that these, 
chemotherapies, the radiotherapy, the removal of lymph nodes have a very great effect on reducing the risk of death from cancer. And obviously, often um, the balance is, uh, you, you will hopefully be able to discuss that, but these are all well-researched treatments for cancer. Um, the consequences of them may be lymphedema. Hopefully, with the new immunotherapy, there's an enormous amount of research going on in cancer. Um, and um, we, we may in the end be in a situation where um, uh, cancer can be treated in an entirely different way from our current treatment and hopefully that will reduce um, the risk of lymphedema. So these are other, these, this is some other studies that were, were done. Um, so removal of lymph nodes, the number of lymph nodes, whether you have a mastectomy or not, Mastectomies are associated with more lymph nodes being removed. Uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, certain chemotherapies, and being overweight. Um, they take overweight from as, as over 20, BMI of 27, which probably excludes about 90% of the people <laughs> who, <laughs> um, that never were. So I was asked to talk about men and cancer-related lymphedema. Men can get breast cancer, about 100 or so every year in Australia do, do get breast cancer. Um, but the majority of men that I see have um, melanomas or squamous cell carcinomas, a number of or prostate cancers. They tend to under-report their lymphedema. They tend to report late. Size matters. So for a man, a large arm, doesn't have the same contextual concerns as a woman who has a large arm. And I call it the um, Ken Rosewall arm. Often men come along and say, look, look at my arm, it's nice and big. So they do tend to report late. Men generally are you know, not terribly happy to wear sock stockings, so we do call them socks, and they don't know the difference. But basically, it is a particular problem often for men that they actually report late um, and uh, the treatment is the same. So all the treatment we will do um, will is the same type of treatment, but often we have, we're starting a lot further back. But there are some things that have happened that actually have reduced or prevented um, lymphedema. And one of the major uh, contributors to the reduction of breast cancer lymphedema and other uh, 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 another cancer-related lymphedema is a sentinel node biopsy. It was a technique that was developed in the 80s and 90s <clears throat> and basically it's a um, where the, the first lymph node which drains the lymph from the cancer site is identified and checked for cancer and if there's no cancers found in that central node, then no further lymph nodes are, are taken. And this was very, very, very important for breast cancer because we got better and better at diagnosing very early breast cancer. So in that case, to actually go ahead and remove a lot of lymph nodes would have caused a lot more problems. So there was a lot of research done in this and there was no evidence of an increase in, in uh, cancers if it was properly the lymph node was properly the sentinel lymph node was properly identified. And this type of treatment has been now used in melanoma surgery and many different types of surgery for cancer. So it's basically meant that um, instead of having to um, a 20% or 25% incidence of lymphedema after removing the lymph nodes, it's now down to 5%. So it's a very significant improvement and reduction um, in lymphedema from that surgical technique. But some, there are some questions to consider. Why is it that even though we remove all these lymph nodes, and you probably had the same number of lymph nodes used that a lot of other people, only 25% of us are going to get lymph node. So even if you've had lymph node removal, the chances are you've got a better chance of not getting lymphedema than getting lymphedema. It's, an, um, it's no joy to you to yeah, know that, yeah, but nevertheless, 
um, it is true. And and a lot of research has in fact been um, directed towards why is it that people don't get lymphedema. And there's um, there's been some interesting research going on. Now these two next slides um, will give you some ideas, but they, they actually aren't going to be something that you're going to be able to use to prevent it. So we do know that there is some early uh, findings that says that you have a genetic um, risk. Um, so this is studies where they've actually gone and looked at some of the genetic coding for primary lymphedemas, that is non-cancer related lymphedema, and they've looked at some of the genetic codes and they find that they're more common in people who have get, get lymphedema after um, uh, cancer treatment. Can't do much about your genetics. The other thing oops, is that we know that people, we've done some uh, studies which show that the way the blood flows and, and moves out from, and fluid moves in the capillaries out into the tissue in the normal arm or non-affected arm can predict for breast cancer. So this is, for instance, if you have perhaps a tendency to get swollen arm hands in the heat, it's not something that you can do anything about, you may have a greater chance of getting uh, lymphedema if you happen to get cancer. So this is looking at the normal and unaffected arm, looking at what that characteristics are and, and so on, and finding it. So it's not all just about lymphedemas. So, oops, oh dear, what's happened? Stay. Stay? I want to yeah. stay. Yeah. <laughs> that won't work. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay, so there's been a lot of talk about in the past, and when we, when I started working, there was lots and lots of do's and don'ts, mm -hmm. lots and lots of don'ts about lymphedema, and there's some of the ones that unfortunately are still in textbooks, and I'll um, and what it boils down to is eventually one felt one couldn't do anything, and I think this was really what came about was that people felt that. If I hadn't done what I was told not to do, I wouldn't have got my lymphedema. Mm. But in fact, there's really no studies, and they're observational studies because we don't normally put people's hand into hot ovens and see if they get lymphedema. But yeah. there's been a lot of studies called observational studies and show that none of, there's no evidence that these will consistently cause or worsen lymphedema. There is no doubt that individually some people will get around about 50% of people can identify a trigger to their lymphedema but it's not consistent and it's really important that um, we throw away a lot of these don'ts and just be a little bit sensible. Obviously a lot of those do's and don'ts um, were about not causing major trauma to your arm which is well, I don't think any of us want to cause major trauma no. to our arm anyway. So, but there is some very good randomised control trials about exercise, um, and what it's shown is that it doesn't worse. There's no worsening of lymphedema with exercise, even weightlifting exercises, repetitive exercises, and there's some evidence, particularly in the early stages of uh, immediately after breast cancer of a protective effect. doesn't protect everyone, but there is some evidence that if you do get a head and exercise, you prevent um, the onset of, of lymphedema. So the current recommendations for, prior, um, uh, for avoiding or reducing the, the uh, incidence of lymphedema is use your arms and your legs absolutely normally. Um, exercise doesn't worsen um, lymphedema and and I think there's, there's starting to be certainly in the upper, upper limb and it, it quite probably in the lower limb as well. The unaffected arm is preferred for repeated blood pressures, for having your blood taken or for putting a drip in, but, and, and particularly 
for vaccinations, but again, look at the word preferred. The research shows that there actually is no um, clear evidence that this actually causes problems. I, we had a fellow um, in Melbourne who has done all his chemotherapy through the affected arm and told us that it didn't cause lymphedema, but um, certainly I wouldn't be prepared to let a young intern or someone late at night on a Friday night put a drip into my arm. So um, certainly in a chemotherapy where we've got very skilled people, it probably doesn't cause it. Now it's important, vaccinations are a different um, kettle of fish because vaccinations are designed to actually cause inflammation to set up an allergic rea a, 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 a reaction. So it's best to um, definitely not <coughs> inject, put vaccinations into your, um, but you've got lots of limits for vaccinations. One of the observational trials did show that a hot sauna should be avoided. It was one of the triggers that seemed to be a problem. So there is, is some research on that. Um, weight maintenance or reduction is important and maintaining good skin hygiene is also important. Um, but I think that's reasonable. So early intervention, about two-thirds, remember about two-thirds of people um, are diagnosed with long-term lymphedema within six months of their surgery. So um, around about 80% within the first 18 months of breast cancer surgery. And um, But it can come on in any time for the rest of your life, you still remain vulnerable and have certainly seen people very, very many years after their surgery. Um, early diagnosis and treatment is, is believed to lead to better outcomes and there's a very big trial going on in America and 400 patients in, uh, uh, in Australia looking at this very um, air, big uh, area and hopefully that will um, will provide some very strong evidence for this. Consequently, it's really important to integrate lymphedema assessment before and after in, in routine follow-up. Um, and, um, and this could lead to very um, uh, significant improvements in all the things that we're hoping for in terms of um, emotional, physical and financial costs of lymphedema. So what we recommend very strongly that you need to have a, um, lymphedema as assessed in a formal or nature within the five, six months of your surgery and then continuing through um, as part of uh, normal practice after cancer surgery. And it really all it does is needs someone with a tape measure and a, a look and a measurement and, and, um, and being able to move forward. It's not really very hard. So research, unfortunately, all this, as I said, we're doing some research, you know, research, research into this early surveillance and early intervention. Um, so there's no, formally there's no long-term evidence of this and this is because it's very difficult um, to do this research and look at it over many, many years. Um, but I think there is research going on and hopefully we'll get... Um, so this is the, some of the, tr the work that I'm sure um, we're doing. Um, if we can do the measurements before surgery, it's always a good thing. I think it's um, interesting that Louise, who wasn't able to come in, said that it's simply going up and talking about it before and saying you're going to come back and check is a great relief to people because they know that it's, it's being looked at and understood and they're not going to be on their own. So the protocol really is to measure both limbs um, and provide education. Um, think about a compression garment. Um, it needs to be prescribed carefully. Um, trial some self-management, massage in the early early stages, exercise regime, weight loss or weight management advice is really important. So these are all parts of things that can, can be integrated in your management after cancer. Monitor it with measurements and you can do those measurements. 
So just finally, there's a fairly bloody looking picture on the side there, but generally there is some um, work being done at Macquarie and also down in Melbourne, um, uh, in Sydney and Melbourne um, for treatment, um, which is a tech, uh, technique called lymphovenous anastomosis. It's a surgical technique where lymph vessels, small lymph vessels are, are found and then directly um, connected to veins and um, they're, they're, um, uh, and this is done um, worldwide. It's, it's become very, very popular. It's been done for many, many years in places like Japan and Taiwan as the primary treatment or the, um, of management of lymphedema after breast cancer. Some 60% of people in those countries actually undergo this procedure early on um, and it's only just being introduced. So we have, we're looking at Macquarie and elsewhere to see really what, um, to, to get a very good handle on whether this is a, an appropriate technique. Um, and um, I was thinking just recently one of the things that will improve lymphedema um, management and awareness and interest is if surgeons get interested in things. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, a, uh, it's a technique that hopefully we can build on um, uh, and, uh, uh, and have some really strong evidence for it. It's a difficult technique. It's done mm -hmm. by plastic and reconstructive surgeons. They need to be very carefully trained in it, but uh, it's certainly um, worth worth thinking about. And it's one that I'm excited about as someone with lymphedema because it's treating the symptom, not the cause. And, That's right. And to the microsurgery to connect that, even to make um, a difference um, with the early stages is pretty mm. exciting for yeah. me. It's come a long way. Yes. So that's my Thank talk. you. And I meant to say to... earlier, Louise, who was meant to be here tonight, um, wasn't able to make it, so it's Ash's I'm not saying I'm <laughs> feeling good here. So yes, I'm sure. Thank Louise you. Sends her apologies. She's probably very upset that she can't be here this evening. So we might just have to have another one. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Asha. Okay. So I'll be. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about well, what can we do to try and help prevent lymphedema, um, and what can we do to help manage lymphedema. Um, so Helen M, or Dr Mackey, has already sort of discussed some of these key risk factors that um, are involved with lymphedema. And as she mentioned, a lot of the research that we have is actually based a lot on breast cancer um, research, um, but it does apply to other types of cancer as well. Um, as well as being aware of what the risks are and ways to reduce your risk, one of the big things, and Helen did touch on this, is monitoring. And knowing how to self-monitor, but also being linked in with a lymphedema therapist that you do regularly go and see and do um, have assessments done so that they can monitor your limb and see if anything's changing. So um, the recommendations are that you do get um, regular monitoring every sort of three to six months. And that's recommended at the moment, usually for the first few years after your treatment. Um, as was mentioned, we do know the majority of people um, do to, uh, that are at risk of lymphedema will develop lymphedema in the first few years after treatment. However, you do have that lifelong risk. Um, so your self-monitoring, um, what you can do. So it's just being aware and having that awareness of your limb um, and knowing if anything changes. So there's early warning signs that you can look for. Um, so things like feeling of heaviness in the limb, um, feeling of fullness or tightness or any aching pain. Um, if your jewellery, your watches, your rings or some clothing starts to feel tighter or your shoes start to feel tighter. Um, we also might see things like what we call transient swelling. So this might be swelling that is there sometimes but then goes away. So maybe by the end of the day you notice your ankle's a bit puffier but when you get up in the morning it has gone down. 
And these are things that we want you to report to your lymphedema therapist um, so that they can have a look at things. Um, and if you aren't due to see your lymphedema therapist and you, you start to feel any of this, it may be worth getting in contact with them. And this is very interesting because at Macquarie we um, are using a type of camera um, called an ICG fluoroscopy, which where we can actually look at um, the lymphatic system through some injections. And if people who are at risk or have early lymphedema, we're actually seeing that where that person is self-reporting changes, that is where we're seeing the changes in the tissue as well. So. Um, do be aware of how you're feeling and do report it. And we know the reason why we really push on about um, monitoring is that we know that if we can um, pick up early changes and get involved at that point, then we do get better outcomes. Um, we hopefully reduce the severity of the lymphedema and improve people's quality of life. Um, so I think Helen's already sort of touched on these. Um, so we want you using your limb normally, we want you exercising, we want you doing good skin care, so using creams regularly. Um, and we know that being of a healthy weight range will help reduce your risk of lymphedema um, and can even improve lymphedema if you, if you do have it. Um, aeroplane travel is a question that does come up a lot and I always get asked about it as a therapist. Um, there is um, some recommendations out there that long-haul flights um, can increase your risk of lymphedema. Um, I have a, num a couple of patients that have developed lymphedema after a long-haul flight, but then again I've got patients that fly and haven't developed any problems. So it's worth speaking to your lymphedema therapist about that if you plan to go on a, a long-haul flight and just having that discussion and making that decision with them um, because again you want to be, if you do decide you want to wear a prophylactic compression sleeve, you want to make sure it's fitting you right um, and correctly. If you um, get something that's not fitting you correctly, it could actually cause more problems than the help it's meant to provide. So there's many ways that we can assess for lymphedema um, and when you go to see your lymphedema therapist, um, the most common is probably the, the limb volume measurements and up in the top left hand corner is the tape measure which we, every lymphedema therapist seems to have about five of them in our handbags. Um, but we use that to measure the limbs um, and to determine the limb volume. So we usually measure both limbs and um, we also look at repeat measurements. So we want to come back and re refer back to the previous measurements that you might have had to see if there is any changes. Um, we can do, we have often assessed the tissue so we have a feel, so we feel like Helen mentioned for any of that hardening area or fibrotic tissue um, and we also feel for any signs of swelling. And we do a, t a test called a pitting test and what you do is you can um, use your thumb and you push it, put it in, apply firm pressure to the tissue and you hold it for a, a minute and if you remove your thumb and it's leaving an indent, well it suggests that maybe there's some swelling there. Um, there's a whole lot of range of different tests that we can do. Um, so in the top right hand corner is an MRI um, where we can look at the amount of fluid versus fat in the tissue. Um, in the bottom right hand corner is an ICG assessment which I'll go into in a moment. And then at the very bottom there's some lymphocentigraphy testing and not everyone will have all of this testing done um, but there is, there, it is out there. In the top of the screen is um, a bioimpedance machine um, or what we call an LDEX machine. And we use this LDEX machine um, a lot in early um, detection and monitoring um, but also through treatment as well. And what it does is it um, sends a very weak electrical signal up through the limb and um, what it's looking at is the amount of fluid in the tissue and compares to the other limb. Um, it works out a number called a lymphedema index and it's not a percentage of difference between the limbs, it's actually a ratio and they say that a normal reading is between minus 10 and plus 10. So you can see in the top the top of the screen, that reading, the 5.2, that suggests to us that that's a normal reading and that person there doesn't have any lymphedema. 
However, on the bottom bar, um, you can see that the LDEX reading there is about is 17.84. So that's outside that normal range, and that would suggest that that person may have some early signs of swelling in the in the tissue. And at that point, we may say, well, we need to monitor you a bit more closely, or actually let's get involved and let's start some early intervention. As well as just looking at a one-off LDEX reading or bioimpedance reading, we again want to look at the trend. So we want to see is how is that changing from your first reading. And ideally, we'd like to see what your reading was before any treatment, but that realistically isn't always the case. And um, not everyone gets to see a lymphedema therapist before they have their surgery. Um, but we do know that if we start to see a change, an increase in your LDEX reading, well then that sort of um, may suggest that there's signs of lymphedema. So it's significant. Well, they used to say 10 points, an increase of 10 points was significant, but more research coming out lately is suggesting actually 7 point increase from your baseline measurement. So this is just showing why we use bioimpedance. Um, you can see here um, the pre-surgical pre baseline at the very left of the screen, and then you can see repeat measurements as you go through. And we are actually picking up um, changes in the LDEX um, that are significant before a person often self is able to self-report, um, and also before we see these volume changes um, with the tape measure. And there is um, research at the moment happening, um, an international start, um, trial including the 400 patients in Australia where they are actually comparing the LDEX machine to tape measure to see um, if, how they compare to each other. So this is just an example of someone that's had regular monitoring. So Anne had breast cancer and she underwent a wide local excision and all the lymph nodes were removed for her armpit, from her armpit. And she also underwent radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And she had the, um, some Taxol treatment as well, which can sometimes increase your risk of developing lymphedema. Um, you can see she wasn't seen, um, she didn't get a pre-surgical reading, but she was seen soon after surgery. And um, she was seen at least once a year for five years. So throughout that treatment, um, her LDEX stayed fairly stable and she didn't ever show any signs of lymphedema. Um, so even though Anne didn't develop lymphedema, after five years of monitoring, um, Anne provided some feedback and she said that it really gave her a peace of mind um, and she knew what to do. She had strategies of what to do if she did have a flare up um, and by attending regular monitoring, she did know um, how to reduce her risk but and also if there was any recent updates in the research that was available. This is just one other example, um, um, Mihaela who's also had breast cancer um, and she had a fairly similar treatment to Anne. However, you can see where this big, um, let's see if I can get a pointer. Um, um, here she had a measurement before surgery um, and she was measured throughout her treatment quite regularly. And you can see when she started to have a Taxol chemotherapy, she get this big spike in her LDEX reading and it goes up to about 30 points. So at this point it suggests that she, is ha she has swelling in her arm and she was fitted with a compression garment at this point. And you can see that through wearing that compression garment it helped to bring her swelling down. And it did stay up through her treatment, but over time and with um, some other treatment, it did come back down. She did have a few flare-ups um, when she was doing some heavy activities, but she knew that with her garment and some lymphatic drains, she would bring that back down. And then uh, four years after treatment, she is actually sitting um, uh, in a good range and that she's got well-controlled subclinical lymphedema. So having this ongoing monitoring allows us to see what's going on with each person and how we can best help. Um, so definitely recommend um, that people look at having some regular monitoring. Okay. 
Um, you may have heard of the new Impedimed device, which is a bioimpedance machine called a Sozo, and that's been looking at coming out soon. Um, and there's some research going on about that. Um, and it also looks at um, body composition as well as um, the bioimpedance. Um, as mentioned, we, there's a few new things coming out. So the ICG fluoroscopy, um, which, will, which we can look to use to map people's lymphatic system, and we're using this to, one, to assess their lymphatic system, but also um, helping us to manage people's lymph, um, lymphedema. So if we um, can see where the problem is and where they're actually draining to, because everyone is so individual, um, we can hopefully improve their treatment outcomes. Um, so this is a staging um, slide of some of a ICG. So you can see stage zero is sort of someone that's at risk of lymphedema. Um, but you can see that we've, they inject a dye into the fingers here and then use the special camera to be able to look at the lymphatic system. And you can see that um, this person has what we call them good lymphatic collectors so that the dye is travelling up those collectors. When you move on to stage one, you can see that it is draining from the hand, but then we start to get a bit of um, congestion here, or what we call dermal backflow, and we can see that there's a bit of a problem here. Um, so they might have quite mild lymphedema, but we can see that there is an issue. And then as you move from stage one to stage four, you can see that progression. Um, and uh, right to stage four, where we can't see any um, well-functioning collectors and there's a lot of congestion in the tissue and a lot of what we call dermal backflow. So they're just some ways that we can assess um, for lymphedema and hopefully then um, if we pick up early changes get involved at that point and improve outcomes. And when we think about how we manage um, lymphedema, we have a huge toolbox and it's about finding what's right for that person. Not everything will work for every person, so we do need to individualise it. But the four main cornerstones of lymphedema treatment are your skin care. Um, we also look at compression. Um, so you can see at the bottom at right hand of the screen is some examples of compression bandaging. And some people need to go through compression bandaging if they've got a lot of swelling in their, in their limb and we need to reduce that or improve the shape of the limb before we consider putting people into compression garments. And there's lots of different types of compression garments. Um, and you could do a whole talk just on compression garments. Um, but it's about talking to your lymphedema therapist um, and trying to figure out, well, what the best option for you is going to be. And sometimes you won't get it right on the first or second time. And it's about just going back and keep trying different things, as you're probably aware. Yeah. <laughs> Um, to try and find what works best for you. Um, so as well as that, we exercise, and there's already been a bit of discussion about exercise, but we know that exercise also helps um, in people that do have lymphedema and not just to help reduce your risk. Um, and it can help improve in lymphatic activity, and we know that exercise, well, you're not going to increase your risk of getting lymphedema or generally make it worse. Um, you do need to be sensible with exercise and talk to your therapist about that before you start anything new um, because you may want to start a graded program and not just go straight straight into something you've never done before. Um, and there is a lot of programs in the community. So, for example, um, the Cancer Council runs the Enrich program. For, so if you're looking to get back into exercise after you've had treatment, you can look at what's around. Um, and there's a lot of group programs that can help you. Um, lymphatic drainage, manual lymphatic drainage or massage is um, another thing that we use. Um, and you can be taught how to do that at home, so you can do it every day if you wanted to. Um, I think this is quite an exciting area to look at because now with the um, ICG, we can actually use it to help just um, to see where people's lymphatics are draining to. And we can actually, I think we're going to see a lot of changes with manual lymphatic drainage um, because we can use this camera to actually figure out, well, what hand movements work best and what is more effective than other things. Um, so we have started using this at Macquarie and then we um, are teaching people how to use um, 
the techniques themselves um, and we're so far getting quite very good results. So for example, I had a lady who came in to see us and she was doing everything and she was doing it all correctly and she just wasn't shifting her arm lymphedema. And we did an ICG and we found where it was draining to and we showed her the pressure to use. And within a week of her, she didn't change anything else, she just did her own SLD at home. She dropped her LDEX by seven points in a week. So you're getting really good results there and it's something to look at for the future. Um, there is a lot of other things that you can look at, um, as we already mentioned, there's laser therapy, um, kinesiology tape, there's compression pumps, and this is something where you're probably seeing more of is the compression pump, um, because there's now companies that will hire them out. So it means that you can use it at home, um, and it means that then you can do something every day, um, and rather than have to go see the therapist as much. Um, so there's so many things out there and it's about trying different things and talking with your therapist and finding out what works best for you because everyone is individual and what works well for one person won't work for the other person. Um, so just keep trying different things. So as well as all that conservative treatment, I'll just quickly touch on some on surgical management. Um, so there's sort of three common surgeries that we're, we're seeing here um, in Australia and at Macquarie. Um, so when we have early stage lymphedema, there's two types of surgery that we um, can look at and the first one is lymph node transfer and that involves transferring a lymph node from one area of the body um, into the affected area with the thought that um, with time the new nodes can function and they'll drain away the ex uh, lymphedema fluid. And then Dr. Mackey's already touched on the LVA surgery um, and Look at, that looks at um, bypassing any areas of blockage by um, putting the lymphatic vessel into the vein um, and there will be some research I think happening soon with that um, and that will be interesting to see the outcomes. Um, for people with advanced lymphedema, um, so we know that in some people they develop fatty changes in the tissue, it's not all fluid. Um, and no matter what they do, their limb won't reduce in size. Um, so um, we can see on MRI that there is fatty changes in the tissue. So one way that we can help with that is to do liposuction surgery where we remove the fat, um, the excess fat, to bring um, the limb back down to the same size as the other the other limb. We're not curing the lymphedema, people still have lymphedema, so they do need to continue with compression garments and that they're 24 hours a day. Um, but here's just an example of one of um, the patients that have had liposuction surgery. So this is a lady who had about an eight litre difference between her, her legs. Um, you can see at three months after surgery and then at 12 months after surgery she's actually a bit smaller on the affected mm. leg than the unaffected leg. And this lady, she's in bright orange tights and um, every time she would come to our clinic, she'd have a new pair of boots and a new pair of tights <laughs> because she could never wear them um, but prior to the surgery. Yeah. And just one other example is this is a lady who um, had a 12 litre difference of her leg um, and when she came to our clinic in the first um, time she was unable to climb the stairs at the front of the clinic and then she sent us a photo and video at three months later she'd climbed the harbour bridge mm -hmm. so and this is her 12 months after surgery and she's actually back at the gym she's running she couldn't run before surgery and she's actually being able to go back to work full-time which she couldn't do before so how do you find someone to help you um, the Australian Lymphology Association um, is the peak body in Australia for lymphedema um, and it has a number of resources on it but it also has a find a practitioner link um, where you can click on that and type in your address or your postcode and it will come up with registered practitioners who have to who are, um, are on there and they complete regular CPD. And then the other thing is to think about if you do have lymphedema is to join the lymphedema registry and the um, websites on that on the screen there um, and basically um, Helen can probably talk to this more but what they're trying to do is collect information about people living with lymphedema so that we can be a better advocate for, for you 
um, and improve the services and hopefully the funding and the access um, to people living with lymphedema because we know it's a huge problem um, and we hopefully can do better and do more. I can't encourage people enough to, that have lymphedema to go onto the registry. It doesn't take long to fill in and it's really important as part of all of our advocacy process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We've got we've covered a lot of these questions <laughs> and we are over time. But I'd just like to a lot of the questions coming through in the chat box are talking about um, you know, why why aren't the the people that are treating them with their GPs or the surgeons talking to them about this issue? Um, and I guess this goes down to further education and trying to advocate for mm. the awareness of it, I guess. I I don't have an answer for it, and I don't know whether you guys have any well, comment I on guess, that. Well, I guess my, I, uh, I have inordinate, um, I think GPs do a fantastic job, and if you knew how much stuff they've got to know, yeah. um, and one of the problems we have is lymph, lymphatic system is one of those parts of the, our body that we're not taught a great deal in medicine, and so... It's it you know there's not the in, imperative to do it. But a good GP, if you go in there and have a talk to them, they'll have a they'll look it up and 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 and, and go for it. But there's they've got a lot to cover. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it's just about getting out I there think, and advocating. I and think the being breast, noisy about it. I yeah. guess from my point of view, the breast cancer and the breast surgeons. I I would say that we went to a, a conference recently at Lura where we put on a, um, a workshop and we were worried that no one would want to come to it and we got over 120 people wow. and 12 surgeons there. Yeah. So It'll the, 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 there is a, a groundswell there. Yeah. And certainly in terms of the breast cancer aspects, a lot of the breast cancer, breast care nurses uh, at least um, trained in terms of being able to provide information to, at least to the level of providing um, patients, people diagnosed with breast cancer, some information and and places uh, yeah. like where I was in Wagga at the time were great enough to actually run mm -hmm. a little workshop for people who are actually going in to have breast cancer surgery. So you actually got a bit of information beforehand um, mm -hmm. to attend a little workshop, and I think that you know to have things like that's um, great. Yeah, yeah. And someone was asking where your clinic is, which is of course Macquarie. Hospital. Yes, yeah. Macquarie and University. we we can share when we send all the resources out. We'll share all the information about where to find you know uh, someone to help you with treatment um, and all those kinds of things. So we share. And so I, would, I would the other thing I would say, having been trying to advocate for services, the most powerful people to advocate for services are, are you. Yeah. You don't feel powerful, but. There's nothing better than someone walking up to a hospital and saying, "Where's your lymphedema service?" They can and 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 want to know that it's there. Um, so, really, that's what I would ask: is that um, that you, if you can push and advocate and complain and mm. and so on, it's 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 wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, we can't answer all the questions, I'm sorry. And I think most of the questions we've got on the slide there, I think we've covered. Um, the one about in older age where your skin is more fragile, I, um, whether you've got any recommendations, like you were saying you use the glove, I guess that would be helpful, but so, there's there anything yeah. else? There's a number of different donning devices, what we call donning devices. So there's um, frames that you can slide your garment over so that it doesn't pull on the skin as you put right. them on. But there's also lots of different types of garments these days. There's not just the one type of garment. So there's things like wraps, compression mm -hmm. wraps that people can use, um, which has sort of come flat and you've you fold them on and you pull them tight, so that can can be an alternative if you struggle to pull your garments on. Yeah, yeah. And I guess if they're seeing a lymphedema therapist, they'll get all this yes. advice. So yeah. I guess that's the number one thing is to go and see the right people yes. and get that right yeah. advice. Yeah. Do you want to click on to the next slide? Oh, yeah. Sure. So again, thirteen, eleven, twenty. Out. That's our information support. Um, if you've got any questions. Um, during working hours and you'd like to ring up and ask, please do. Um, we also have an online community if anyone's interested in online support groups or forums or blogs, you can get on there and type away and chat to other people. 
And again, Lifeline 13, 11, 14, if there's anything that's come up for you tonight that you'd like to talk to someone about. Um, so thank you all so much for coming and watching us and listening tonight and all the great chat. And sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We're probably going to have to have another webinar, maybe about garments or some other topic we'll talk about it. And thank you all for coming on the panel tonight and sharing your information, sharing your story, Helen. It's been really great. If there's one last little yeah, thing sure. I might be able to say. It's just to say, particularly in terms of trying to find information, and we've talked a little bit about it. So there's information on the Cancer Australia website where they have a lymphedema uh, booklet, which is great. There's the Breast Cancer Network of Australia, so the BCNA website. So um, whether you have primary or secondary lymphedema, there's a great fact sheet on lymphedema, which includes travel and information on subsidies. Um, Cancer Council have a new Understanding Lymphedema uh, fact sheet, which is great, so I recommend you go to their website. The ALA, the Australasian Lymphology Association, have uh, exercise DVDs for um, upper body and lower body that can be purchased as well as other information. Okay. And the Lymphedema Support Group of New South Wales is a great uh, website to have a look for a lot of information. And in terms of at least New South Wales, there are other support groups in other states in, in Australia. But for me being in New South Wales, and I can't encourage people enough to have a look at those um, websites in your state and see if they do hold things like lymphedema mm -hmm. information days. And although it may involve a lot of travel, I think you'll find it'll be really worthwhile. There's a lot of really good practitioners, consumers, a lot of sharing of information, new technology, and there's often um, people who sell the garments. So you actually get a bit of a try before you buy, and you can actually have a look at all the latest technology mm. and garments and donning um, devices, and it gives you really opens your eye up to, to a lot of new information and keeps you excited about um, new things developing in lymphedema. Mm. So. And we'll share all those links in a document, so you can just we'll email it to you. You can just click on it. So. Please don't think you have to remember no, all of that. <laughs> but just in the meantime, in case you got yeah. excited after the webinar and you just wanted to look into a few things, there are a few key things that I can't emphasise enough. So. Yeah. so thank you for everyone that's hung in with us and um, stayed with us over time. Um, when we're finished, a little exit survey is going to pop up. So we'd love you to take the time to answer just a few short questions to help us um, with the webinars that we present that we're helping you and giving you the right information. So we'd appreciate it if you take part in the exit survey. And thank you again for coming along and thank okay. you to everyone out there. Thanks and we'll say everyone. good night. See you later. Good night.